morning, church. Good morning. My name is Matt Croft. I'm the senior pastor here, and it's an exciting day. It's Vision Sunday at Trinity Baptist Church, and I can think of no greater way to start off such a service uh, than baptism. And we have three baptisms today, uh, so I'm excited about that. I want you to meet A.J. Griffith. Many of you know A.J. Uh, he grew up in our church, but he wants to uh, go public today with his testimony of following Jesus. AJ, I have two questions for you, man. Uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, and he rose from the grave? Yes. Have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Well, based on your own profession of faith, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. This is actually AJ's girlfriend, Lauren, Lauren Wheeler, and she wants to make public her testimony of following Jesus as well. Lauren, let me ask you the same questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the grave? Yes. Have you trusted in him as your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Well, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary, the Christ of baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. One more. It's nice and warm, huh? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's sort of like a hot tub in here. Carl gets us nice and warm. All right, this is James Bush. Uh, James's parents, James's parents, Josh and Sarah, are already members here. I know uh, his uh, grandmother Cynthia came in. Uh, we are so excited uh, to share in his testimony as well. James, let me ask you the same two questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave? Yes. Have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Based on your profession of faith, I baptize you now, my brother. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. You did it. Well done. <laughs> Getting some swimming in too here. <laughs> we might need some rescue divers next time. Uh, let me pray as we open our service. Uh, Father, thank you so much uh, for the beautiful testimonies that we've just seen. In a sense, for the sermons that were just preached about Jesus having brought new life to each of these three. Lord, I pray that they would grow in their faith. I pray that we would be encouraged. I pray that people who don't yet know Jesus, whether watching online or in this room with us, that they would also repent and believe in Christ and know his forgiveness and freedom and hope and joy and love. Lord, uh, be honored throughout our service today. Thank you for your love. Thank you that we have something worth celebrating in your salvation, in the great God that we serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Nathan. Good morning. My name is Nathan Chesser, and I'm a student pastor at Trinity Baptist Church, and it is awesome to have you in the house of the Lord this morning as we celebrate baptisms, new life in our church, and as we cast vision for the coming year. And we're very excited by how we're going to see the Lord work in this congregation. And in my two and a half years here, I've seen the Lord work in some pretty incredible ways, both in the functions of our ministries, but also specifically in the lives of many people sitting in this room. And I am very encouraged by everything that I'm going to see the Lord do in this church and in this community for the coming year. If you're visiting with us this morning, you will find guest information and the visitor cards in the pews in front of you. We would love to have you fill these out and place those in the offering plate in the foyer so that we can learn more about you and how we can minister to you. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. 
God, I thank you for this day, Lord, and I thank you for this time that we have, and I thank you for each and every single person in this room. God, I thank you for the facilities we have, this place that we have where we can come here and worship you, God, intentionally together as a church family. And Lord, as we cast vision for this coming year, we pray that no matter what we do or where we go, that you will be glorified and magnified above all, God that you will be on the throne, and that, God, we will make your name great in all that we say and do. And so, God, I pray that you bless the work of our hands in glorifying you, that, God, that you will bring revival to our community as we see more people come to call upon you as their Lord and Savior than ever before. Let baptisms become the norm every Sunday here, God, to glorify and magnify your name. And God, I pray for each and every single person in this room right now, no matter what anybody is dealing with or struggling with, Lord, I pray that they will lay those at the altar, God, and that you will provide them rest, comfort, and peace that only you can provide, Lord Jesus. I pray that you will bless the sermon that Pastor Matt will be bringing to us today, and you will bless the remaining time of our worship. And it's in your name I pray, amen. Well, it is great to see you all on this second Sunday of 2023. Uh, this morning, we are singing of the greatness of God. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 16 says, But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. I want to ask if you would please stand this morning as we sing, How Great is Our God. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let's see. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And
be seated, please. Church family, um, we've uh, talked a lot in the past about the ministry of the North American Mission Board. North American Mission Board has two main uh, ministry areas of focus. One is uh, disaster relief, and a bunch of you have served here locally at the Send Relief Ministry Center that's actually run a joint ministry of the North American Mission Board and our association. But the other thing that the North American Mission Board does is church planting all across the United States and Canada. And one of our vision elements that I've talked about over the past couple of years is that we uh, would be filled with new life. We'd be in, involved and, and helping to promote new life and new growth within the church of Jesus Christ. And in this sense, I mean that beyond the walls of our church, new churches. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, you see Paul the Apostle planting new churches. He's going around, he's starting churches where there wasn't one before. And, and he'll raise up leadership and go do it again. Uh, it's good for us as a church, that's, we're not a new church, we're not a brand new church, but it's good for us to be part of of those kinds of works, uh, not only because they're brand new and they need financial support, volunteer support, but because I think it's good for us. Being around new life is invigorating. Uh, it, it, it helps keep us excited about the mission uh, and, and thinking about how what we see there can have application here. So one of the cities that the North American Mission Board is focusing on is St. Louis. So I reached out a few months ago to uh, the leadership for church planting in St. Louis and said, can you connect us with the church there that is really early in the process? And the reason I said that was because I'd love for us to see as much of the process as possible in terms of our pastoral leadership or volunteers who go there on mission trips or uh, missions uh, committee leadership and so on. So in response to that request, they connected us with a church called Requiem Church. Many of you have, were here when I showed the video with their pastor, Vince Bissey, uh, a month or two ago. Requiem Church is actually in Alton, Illinois. It's right across the, the Mississippi River. Um, so it's a suburb of St. Louis, sort of like West Memphis is of Memphis, or South Haven, or one of those cities. It's across the state line, but it's part of that metro area. It's a really unique community, Alton is. Uh, it has a lot of blue-collar folks, but it also has sort of this thriving arts scene. It's one of these small towns that is experiencing a lot of revitalization downtown, and, um, and arts are part of that. Very creative people there. This church is only a year uh, into their process. Uh, Pastor Vince Bissey, who... Uh, who's there, he left another local church nearby, August Gate Church, which years ago I visited. Uh, they were a North American Mission Board church plant in St. Louis probably 10, 15 years ago, and they've birthed multiple other churches. So Vince was on their staff basically learning how to do what they've done and then launched out of that other church in St. Louis and took a couple of families with him purposefully to launch this new work. So uh, during this time, during this year, they've been meeting in their home with a community group on Sunday mornings, like Sunday school, and then they've actually been having a public worship service. This is really different, but it's on Wednesday night, and they have been meeting at another church locally that has offered for them to use their facility on Wednesday nights. But, and many of you will remember this from when our church was in Cordova Community Center, they've been having to do portable set up and tear down. How many of you remember those days of Trinity? There was a lot of people still here, and you might have scars or even be sore still from that, right? I've been through that. When we were in Tallahassee, we were doing portable uh, set up and tear down out of middle school. It's a lot of work every single week to have to arrive at church early, as you know, set everything up, do church, serve in many areas, and then when you're done, you can't go home, you can't go to lunch, you got to tear down. That's what they've been doing um, at Requiem Church for about a year. But now, 
as I mentioned uh, to you a few weeks ago, they have an opportunity to have their own space. Now, it's not a space that they own. It's actually at another Southern Baptist church that has extra space, but they will be able to keep their things set up. And so they can focus more of their energies on, on reaching people and hosting people when they're there. Here's the funny thing. The guy who's the pastor of the church that's hosting them now is a friend of mine. And actually, he and his wife met through the same Baptist Collegiate Ministries that Christy and I met through just a few years later. And so he and his name is Alex. His wife is Kelly. Alex and Kelly Melton are the pastor of the church that's now hosting the church we're working with. They went through the same Baptist, same college ministry, got married, and went to the same seminary after me. So they followed this uh, uh, very similar path to Christy and I. And that was not why, how we got connected with Requiem Church. But it's pretty neat to see the connection. I feel like it's maybe the Lord is working in this. <laughs> so you have a, a very established Southern Baptist Church, Heartland Baptist Church in the same city, that has said to Requiem Church, a brand new church plant, you can use this section of our facility and leave your stuff set up and do your church plant work and eventually of course they'll they'll want to get their own building but this is part of the process it's a really neat example in my opinion of partnership between SBC churches who are very different they're going to have very different flavor and feel but they all care about reaching lost people and so we uh, have been able to partner with them by providing furnishings for that new space uh, missions committee voted uh, to give of the funds that you had already given to our missions uh, offering. So uh, Jerson and I went up there right after Alpine Village, it was mid-December. We took a quick trip up there, got to see the area. I, I have too much information to share just today, so I'll give you updates in, in a little bit, a few weeks or months, kind of just give you some more information. But I just want to show a quick video of me and those two pastors. One is Alex Melton. He's of the pastor of the established church that's hosting Requiem. The other is Vince Bissey, who's the pastor of the new church plant. You got all those uh, names and ideas in your head? I know it's a lot. Let's watch this. Hey, Trinity Baptist family. This is Pastor Matt Crawford. And we're excited to be here on the campus of Parkland Baptist Church. But it's also the site of where Requiem Church will be doing their main worship services. I want to introduce you to Vince Bissey. He's the pastor at, uh, and church planner at Requiem Church. And this is Alex Melton, who's the pastor here at Harlem Baptist Church. And it's, it's really funny. I'll tell you more about the connection between me and uh, Alex. We go way back. Um, but we're, we're excited to be here. Uh, guys, we're excited about the partnership. Um, Alex, would you just tell our, our church family a little bit about your church and just about the partnership? Absolutely. Our church is uh, it's a 50, uh, almost 55-year-old um, established Southern Baptist church uh, here in the Alton and Godfrey area, uh, and we have a heart to make disciples um, amongst our neighbors and the nations. Uh, so we want to see people uh, come to follow Jesus here in our community and then amongst the nations. And uh, we've had a heart for our church to be involved in church planning, and so I met Vince uh, but less than, about a year ago or so, because um, Vince literally lives almost in our backyard. And so uh, heard about his heart to uh, meet, uh, to reach blue collar creatives and people in our community and what they were doing. And so Vince and I got the chance to talk about what it would look like to, for our church to partner together as, um, as a sponsor church and what we could do to reach people in our community together. So Vince, tell our people a little bit just about, you know, the journey so far for Requiem Church and your vision yeah. uh, for, like, like you mentioned, the Blue Collar Creatives yeah, and, yeah. and also your setup here. Right. So the, the vision for Requiem Church is that we, we're asking God to use us to help suffering people find rest in a strong and beautiful God. And as we've sought to do that, we really believe that that, that vision of God from Psalm 96, 6, that he's both strong and beautiful is a key piece of this. Because when we talk about our, the blue collar creatives, blue collar, the, the blue collar community really does value strength and hard work and effort. And the, the creative community values beauty and creating things that have, have beauty and express themselves in that way. And what I think most people in that community don't realize is that God is the source and the goal of all of that. And so what we're trying to help to do is really reframe those things that they value so deeply and help them understand where it comes from and why it matters. Thank you. And we're so excited at Trinity to be able to 
to partner. Uh, you, our church family, uh, purchased the furnishings uh, in this room for their worship yep. space. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Absolutely. It's your generosity, and so we encourage you to continue on in that and press on so we can continue to do be part of works like this. Mm -hmm. And we're working on uh, some ideas uh, for our short-term mission trips here. We'd love to bring some folks up here as well. We're just thankful to be able to partner together in the gospel uh, and and uh, look back from heaven and see God's work uh, to bring souls to salvation and make disciples. So Absolutely. thank you, church. Thank you guys yes. so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Well, so Jerison's a pretty good video guy. And uh, w believe it or not, we did that in one take. I was amazed. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it looks, it looks a lot different from our meeting space, doesn't it? Uh, but the Bible doesn't prescribe, uh, I mean, early church, they were meeting in homes, right? Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a lot different than how we do church, but we are in the same, on the same team. We're engaged in the same mission. So uh, I'll keep giving you updates with them. I'm excited for us to connect with them and partner uh, and serve in the ways that the Lord gives us opportunities. So let's pray uh, for Requiem and Heartland Baptist Church right now as part of our missions moment and our intercessory prayer. Father, uh, right now we come to you and we thank you that you have given us mission and purpose. You've not left us to just drift. Lord, you've given us a reason to get up and get after our day for the sake of people coming to know Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would give us that kind of passion. God, I thank you for connecting us with Requiem Church and Heartland Baptist Church. Uh, for these friends and ministry that you've given me and Jerison. Lord, I uh, ask this morning that you would encourage them as, as they're meeting in service and meeting in community groups. Lord, I pray that you would bring revival through Trinity Baptist Church, through Heartland Baptist Church, through Requiem Church. Lord, I, I just think about the way that Paul writes letters as he's serving amongst one church and encouraging another church, or even he's in prison and still trying to encourage other believers. God, we are in this together with other believers all around the world. God, so I ask that you would take uh, the, the resources that Trinity, the the people of Trinity has, have provided for Requiem Church and use them to reach lost people with the message of hope in Jesus. Lord, I pray uh, that you would be glorified and that you'd anoint both of those pastors and speak through them today and every time they open your word. Now we pray for those in our church and community who are hurting. We pray uh, for your hand uh, to be on Karen Hudson, that you'd heal her of cancer, that you'd strengthen her. Be with those in our church uh, who have gotten COVID recently. We thank you for those who have already recovered from that. Be with those who are still uh, dealing with it. And bring them back to us safely and soon. Lord, we pray that you bless our whole service and be honored and glorified through our response to your word. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. says, though the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What great news. Our God is faithful. Would you please stand as we sing, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated, please. Turn with me, please, to Colossians 4. Uh, this Tuesday for Joy Group, our, um, we had to have a change in schedule because uh, someone who was our speaker had to pull, pull out. Uh, so I am plan B for Joy Group. Uh, it'll be 10.30 a.m. this week. And I'll actually be talking uh, about what I wrote my uh, PhD dissertation on, which sounds really boring, I know. I promise you it's not. Uh, it's an exciting topic about how God uses beauty in the world to draw people to himself. So we'll be talking about that. Turn with me, please, to Colossians 4. Uh, the second week of the year, we have a pattern of what we call Vision Sunday. It's something like a state of the church address. Uh, we will look at scripture, uh, but I want to give you an update on where we are and where I believe the Lord is leading us. And so I think it was really fitting to have baptisms today on Vision Sunday, because that's, we are all about people coming to know and follow Jesus. So I'm grateful for God's timing in that. It's also fitting that at the end of our service, we're going to have a very important special call business meeting to vote on our candidate for pastor of Hispanic ministries. That's been something that has been uh, building and, and we've been working towards for a really long time. In fact, even before I came. Um, so it, it's encouraging to me <laughs> that in God's timing and providence that both of those are happening on our vision day. We do a vision sermon every year to talk about how we are seeking to fulfill the mission of Christ in 2023. And it's important for you to know this. The mission of Jesus doesn't change. There's, I told uh, Nathan, I think, earlier the, a week or two ago, you could almost get up and do your mission and vision sermon and say the same thing every year. Now, that obviously would not be a good idea for me to do. But the mission of Jesus doesn't change. How we flesh it out might change year over year. But the mission, the marching orders that Jesus has left for his people, it's the same for every Christian in every church, in every town, in every country, across all time periods of the church. It's what we call the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says Jesus came near. This is after his resurrection, right before he ascends into heaven. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he's God, he has all authority, and at this point, he's conquered every rival. He's defeated Satan, he's defeated sin, he's defeated death, and he's standing there, he is in charge. He's won. <laughs> and in that authority, he says, go therefore and make disciples. And I've explained to you before that the main verb, kind of the controlling verb in the original Greek language in this section is make disciples. That's kind of the, the heading over all of it, the main command. And he says, as you do that, you should baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's why we use the language we just used three times up there. Baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. So it's not just that we're making converts. Hey, repeat this prayer after me and then go ahead and do whatever you want the rest of your life. No, it's disciples who are learning Jesus' teaching and putting it into practice. That's what it means to be a disciple. And Jesus says, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. He's not left us alone. He's empowering this mission. He, sent, he, he ascended and then a few days later sent the Holy Spirit to be his continuing presence in our lives. God's continuing indwelling presence in our lives. That is the mission, the unchanging mission. And if we as a church aren't doing things that contribute to that mission, we are wasting our time. We're wasting our money. We're wasting our energy and our spiritual gifts. And let me tell you, many churches waste their time and money 
and energy and spiritual gifts. It doesn't take long. It doesn't take much for drift from the mission to happen. It doesn't take much for us to, to turn inward or to get distracted from the mission. That's why I think it's important that we are frequently reconsidering what we are doing, reconsidering how we use resources, reconsidering the use of our time and talents to make sure that we are faithfully following the marching orders given to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is in charge. He's the boss. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And this will be the third year in a row uh, that we've done vision sermons. And there's something that I've said all three times that I want to review with you quickly. It's a set of core values that flow out of the Great Commission. We as a staff have talked about these and, and, I, and I even want to do a better job communicating them on a regular basis. But I think we should always be moving toward these. So this is sort of vision for every year. Number one, that we are centered on the gospel. The word gospel, I hope you recognize that because we try to build it into everything we're doing. It is the message of good news. That's what the word literally means. Good news of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. That's the only way we're saved. That's the only way we're sanctified. That's the only way we're going to be with Jesus forever. That's the only power for anything we do in God's mission. It comes through the gospel. We have to be centered on that in everything we do. That's almost kind of the, the top heading amongst this whole list. Number two, built on the word, meaning not, not my wisdom, because that's pretty small, uh, or, or anyone else's wisdom or cultural wisdom, but we are built on this book as a church in terms of our doctrine, what we believe, and what we do, our practice, faith and practice, as theologians describe it. What we believe, what we do, that this is our authority. Number three, we as a church should be known for love. Jesus said that they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. He says that in John 13. So we're known for the love, the way in which we take care of each other, but also known for love in our community. And that touches on uh, another one further down the list as well. Number five, or excuse me, number four, we should be a church that gives sacrificially. That includes our finances, giving of our resources to God's mission, but that also includes, as, includes, as I mentioned before, our, our energy, our time, our spiritual gifts, our talents, whatever it is that he's given you that can be a blessing to his church and the ministry of it. Number five, we should be a church that is full of deepening disciples, meaning we are all pressing forward, growing in our faith. As scripture says, spurring one another on, like you spur a horse, spurring one another on to love and good deeds, helping each other to grow. I need you in that. We all need each other in that. Number six, that we should be rooted in our community. The people right outside these doors should know who we are, and if, and if we, if this church ceased to exist tomorrow, that they would know it and miss it. We should be engaged in the lives of people here in Cordova, all across Memphis. And then finally, number seven, that we should be filled with new life. And I mean that in two senses. One, that we should be a church seeking uh, passionately to reach the next generation with the gospel. Through youth and children, seeing young families come into our church. And then also filled with new life in terms of new believers. So... I mean, look, I, I want people who have been Christians for decades who move into Memphis, I want them to come to Trinity Baptist Church. And that's great. And we've had a lot of members like that. I also want people who are far from God <laughs> in our community to hear about the gospel from us and repent and believe and become baby Christians and grow. That's what I mean by filled with new life. The, the, that's, that's the vision. And you're going to hear me talk about this every year about the second week of January. <laughs> Okay, because I think that those are core principles that flow out of the Great Commission and what God has called us to be. Uh, last year, uh, my vision sermon was called A Family on a Mission. Uh, and that sort of has become just a phrase that I've tried to repeat a lot. And I plan on continuing to repeat it. Hey, Emma, I forgot to green that shirt up here. Will you grab me that shirt, please? Me and uh, Ken Lankford are working on, this is, this is not the final version, I don't think, but working on this kind of a prototype. 
Trinity Baptist Church, a family on a mission. Okay, I'm going to get a bunch of these. I want you to get them and wear them in our community and, and wear them when we do service projects just to communicate that idea. And the reason I use that five-word phrase is because it encapsulates the two main parts of our mission, discipleship and evangelism. The family aspect is that discipleship, that the people who are already here are cared for well and that they are enabled to grow in their faith. They're helping each other to grow in their faith. That's that family aspect. But it's not a family that's saying it's just us. It's a family on a mission. It's an outward-looking family to say, who else out there can come into God's family, can be part of this family through, through what he's called us to do? A family who is on a mission. As we think about the year ahead and try to make sure that we are oriented toward our mission, I want you to see some of Paul's final words of encouragement for the Christians in the city of Colossae. We actually looked at a larger section in chapter 4 of Colossians almost two years ago as I was preaching through the whole book. I'm not going to look at that big section. I'm only going to look at five verses today. As I prepared for this Sunday, my mind kept going back to one phrase used by Paul in his instructions to this church. Let's read these verses. Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word. That's the phrase my mind kept going back to. That God may open a door. To speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. He's writing this from prison. He's not having a pity party in prison. He's encouraging them to engage in the mission. So that I may make it known as I should. He's saying, pray for me. I'm here in prison. And we know examples of when God did open doors for Paul, even while he was in prison. Sometimes literal doors, and he was able to walk out. But also, a door to speak the gospel. Can you imagine being the guard chained to Paul, you were going to hear about Jesus. <laughs> you, were, you were the captive audience, even though Paul was the captive. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time, or redeeming the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. I, I think this is a great text for the vision of a church. Paul tells the Colossian Christians, first of all, to pray. And in their prayer, they must seek God so that the Lord himself will open a door to them for the word. We want God to open a door. I believe he's been opening doors. That's our first point. Number one, start with prayer, acknowledging our need for God to work. Our need for him to open doors. Our need for him to enable our mission. Our need for him to open hearts and minds to the gospel as we speak it. Start with that acknowledgement. That's how he starts off in this section. Devote yourselves to prayer. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine. Picture like a grapevine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me or abides in me and I in him produces much fruit. Not in themselves, but because they're abiding in Jesus. They're staying connected to him. There's life and power and, and, and hope and joy and holiness. They all flow from Jesus. In him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If that branch is cut off from the vine, it dies. There's no fruit produced there. Trying to accomplish the mission of the church without relying on the Lord is like trying to drive a car with no gas in it. Or maybe even a stronger analogy, trying to accomplish the mission of the church without relying on the Lord is like trying to fly to the moon without even having a rocket. You're not going to get started. We can do literally nothing apart from Jesus. And prayer, he connects us to prayer, prayer not only reminds us that, of that reality that we need him to work, it's one of the main ways that we express faith in him and ask him to do the work that only he can do. And we also express faith, I think, by stepping out and obeying. But prayer is clearly the main way we ask for him to work. We engage in faith. He says, devote yourself to this. 
It's not make sure you pray every so often. Devote yourself to it. Be passionate. Be committed to it. Stay alert in it. It's his next phrase. So praying uh, vigilantly, right? Pray without ceasing, the same author says elsewhere. He tells us to pray, I think, based on the real needs and challenges and opportunities that you see around you. I think that's what means, he means by stay alert. You're, you're looking around you and thinking and praying based on what you see, based on the doors that you see God's opening or the opportunities or challenges. Uh, just one challenge that's weighing heavily on my heart right now. You can pray that the Lord provides the financial resources that we need for ministry. Early reports on the close of 2022 show that we came in about $100,000 below our proposed budget for 2022. And our budget for 2023 is about $100,000 more than that budget. So in the coming weeks, myself and our finance team are going to have to look at that closely and make the right decisions and recommendations. Would you diligently pray for us for wisdom? I mean, that's, that's been weighing on my heart and I'm preaching this text and I think the Lord is saying, You've got to pray. That was the way I <laughs> felt like I should apply this text this week. Would you pray that God provides for the ministry that he wants us to do? That's where the rubber meets the road in terms of our faith. And as we pray and bring challenges and opportunities to the Lord, I love what Paul says next. He says, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. I've pointed that same phrase out to you in Philippians 4, 6 before. Be anxious for nothing, for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That phrase, thanksgiving, appears here as well, with thanksgiving. And that is really, really important, I think, to the entire section. We look backwards... Engaging in intentional thanksgiving, reflecting on God's faithfulness. I, you got me through that. <laughs> you were there for me when I was struggling with this issue. You provided for this ministry that you called us to do as a church. And as we look back with thanksgiving, we're enabled to trust Him with faith today and in the future. Does that make sense? That's one of the reasons I'm going to show you a, a year in review video from 2022 in a moment. Because I think it's helpful as we're casting vision forward to look back with thanksgiving. Uh, most of you or maybe all of you are familiar with Neil Armstrong, the first man who walked on the moon. But you might not be as familiar with some of what Neil Armstrong lived through prior to getting to that point prior to being chosen to lead the first mission to land on another heavenly body. This is from a magazine published by the University of Cincinnati. After he was an astronaut, Neil Armstrong went to teach at the University of Cincinnati. Can you imagine having him as a professor? It would be amazing. The, the magazine says this, During combat in the Korean War, Armstrong was making a low bombing run, run when anti-aircraft fire hit his F-9F Panther. He lost control and collided with a pole. It's not a good thing when you're flying a plane, which sliced off three feet of his right wing. Armstrong flew the plane back to friendly territory, intending to eject over water, but his ejection seat was blown back over land. Rather than getting the expected Navy rescue, a roommate from flight school picked him up as he passed by in a Jeep. <laughs> Can you imagine that conversation? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Second story, in 1966, Armstrong's first space flight took place in Gemini 8. Many of you probably remember this. While he was docking with an unmanned Agena rocket, that was history's first successful docking of two vehicles in space, a malfunctioning thruster sent the interlocked space vehicle, so they're connected, tumbling uncontrollably. They're spinning and tumbling so fast that it could have damaged the rockets or they could have, the astronauts could have blacked out. It was spinning so fast, and they would have probably died. Armstrong calmly disconnected the two vehicles, brought Gemini 8 back under control, and made a safe emergency landing in the Pacific. NASA officials said he exhibited extraordinary piloting skill. 
third story. In 1968, more than a year before the moon landing, Armstrong came close to death in the lunar landing research vehicle. This was like a practice landing vehicle that they're flying around on, on Earth to practice landing the lunar module. At Ellington Air Force Base near Houston, on a simulated lunar descent, leaking propellant caused a total failure of flight controls. About 200 feet above the ground, he employed the ejection seat, not by choice, as he later noted. The quick action saved his life as the vehicle crashed. You can see pictures of this online if you Google it. And went up in flames seconds later. Subsequent analogous, analysis suggested that, he, if it had, excuse me, that if he had ejected 0.5 seconds later, his parachute would not have opened in time. As it was, his only injury was a hard tongue bite. So, why do I say all that? You can see why NASA leadership, when they looked back at his track record, thought, this guy has the right stuff, <laughs> right? He's a survivor. He has the knowledge and experience and clear-headedness in difficult situations to be able to handle the first landing on the moon. And he needed every bit of it. Since as Apollo 11 was come in, not, not only did they have uh, multiple computer, uh, computer uh, problems, with the software they were running. He also had to fly about four miles further downrange because there was a big crater in the area where they were supposed to land. He picked the right guy. He looked at his track record in the past and rightly determined that he could handle in the future what a moon landing might throw at him. Here's the, here's the point. When we look back at God's faithfulness in the past, when we intentionally think about how he's gotten us through difficult situations. We are filled with thanksgiving, as Paul says here. His track record of complete faithfulness in Scripture, in the church, in church history, and in our lives shows that he can handle whatever we're dealing with. And just to be clear about the illustration, the article I was quoting about Neil Armstrong starts out with a story from 1971 when he was a college professor and his car rolled down an embankment and then hit another car. And they found out that this guy, who had landed on the moon just a couple of years prior, had forgotten to set the emergency brake. <laughs> Only God's perfect. <laughs> Only God is completely faithful. And as you look back and reflect on what he's done, it can give you faith to see him open doors today and in the future. So with that in mind... I want you to watch this year in review video that, that I put together this week. Think about God's faithfulness as we watch it.
So as, as you look at that, I hope you join me in thanking God for the blessings that he gave us in 2022, whether it's baptisms or new members and new families joining our church, new babies born, growth in our ESL ministry, new opportunities with our local schools, and a new partnership with the church plant that I talked about earlier. Many of the things you saw in that video fit with the core values that I've shared about each year, centered on the gospel. We're sharing the gospel through Vacation Bible School, through supporting International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board. We should be built on the Word. We're sharing God's Word and growing in it through Bible studies. You saw a discipleship group there with Pastor Jerson and uh, Billy Cullen, Billy Cox, Frank Davison. Um, we should be known for love. You have done that through serving at Youth Villages and Brinkley Heights through the Matthew 25 Venezuela ministry. We should give sacrificially. You've done that through the Bible Translation Project where we funded Scripture being translated into four languages used in Madagascar. God provided for that. God was faithful in that. Deepening disciples. We mentioned discipleship groups and Sunday school classes and Wednesday Bible studies. We have a prayer group on Mondays that meets. We've initiated or been part of the Memphis Prayer 365 initiative. Rooted in our community. I'm excited about what's going on at Cordova Middle School and High School and the partnerships the Lord has given us there and an ESL, and then finally filled with new life. I didn't have any pictures of the new babies that have been born, but that's exciting to me, uh, the new believers and the baptisms. Would you pray with me that God gives us more, <laughs> many more? There is such a great need in this city that we love. There are so many who need Jesus' forgiveness, who need their basic needs met, who need to know that violence is not the answer. Jesus is the answer. Let's devote ourselves to prayer, as Paul says in Colossians 4, for God to use our church to change our city and our world. Scripture says in the book of Acts that the world was turned upside down. By the way, he used 12 disciples. we got a few more than 12 here. His power is no less. We can do nothing apart from Jesus. So we start with prayer, asking him to open doors. And then number two, step through the doors God opens. This might seem obvious, but sometimes we pray and then we don't follow through. He puts opportunities for mission and for loving people and for speaking the gospel right in our path and we're not paying attention. Or we get scared or ashamed. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make it known as I should. If we're asking for something in prayer, shouldn't we in faith expect an answer? So stay alert for that. Watch for it. And then when he opens the door, go. And he's not just praying He's, he's not saying some kind of random door. He's very specific. He says a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ. When Paul uses that word, the mystery of Christ, or that phrase, he, he means that it was formerly concealed, the truth about the full gospel, but now it's been revealed, and it's our job to share it, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which Paul is currently in chains. Even though he's in that situation, he says, I want to continue to speak it. He's not uh, he's not afraid of, of punishment. He's literally imprisoned, and it's not shutting him up. Pray that I'll speak it as I should. That's the pattern for us as well. We are to pray for God to open doors for us to share the word, to speak of Jesus to the people around us who don't yet know him. We are to be making it known as we should. Notice there's a corporate aspect to that. Paul's writing to them, asking them to pray. Specifically, that God will open the door for him to be in ministry. But clearly, he's setting for them an example that you should be praying for this, that you should be seeking the open doors and stepping into them. And so I've mentioned uh, our partnerships with public schools. I've mentioned this opportunity we have to vote at the end of our service about Hispanic ministry. For a long time, I have felt that beginning a specific service to geared towards those for whom Spanish is a primary language, is their primary language, that that would 
fit really, really well with our ESL ministry. That it would fit remarkably well with the community that's right outside our doors. I think that's an open door for us. St. Louis Church Partnership is an open door. Our rec camp that Lisa put together this past summer, and I, the vast majority of kids that were there, I did not recognize. That's an open door. The thousands of people who came to Alpine Village, that's an open door. Our children's ministry is crucial. There are so many families that God brought through our doors this past year. So many more who still need to follow Jesus. God has opened doors, so let's walk through them. Now that the holidays are over, I've started personally calling the 116 Alpine Village families who requested more info on our church. I want to invite them. You all loved them well when they were here on this campus. Let's invite them back. What doors, here's the application question for you, what doors for ministry and speaking the gospel has God opened in front of you? And I don't, I don't limit that to what's happening here on this campus. Think for a moment. What are the opportunities that God has given you? Do the people that you rub shoulders with know that you're a Christian? Have they experienced the love of Jesus through you in practical ways? A pastor friend of mine says that the most likely way that people will try a new church is on the arm of a trusted friend. Who are you that trusted friend to? And are you thinking of your friendships in those terms? I'm not saying pin all your evangelism on bringing them here, although I, I hope you bring them here. But a lot of times they'll listen to you more than they'll listen to me because they know you and trust you. Have you told them about your hope in Christ? So how do you act toward people who are not Christians, who are not part of the church? That's our last challenge. That's how Paul uh, exhorts us in the last two verses of our passage. Verse 5, act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. So he says this, here's the application point. Love people through your words and actions so that you will have an opportunity to speak the gospel as you should. Act wisely. Think about the way you interact with people. Speak in a way that it's like it's seasoned with salt. I I cooked a, some of you saw on Facebook, I cooked a couple of ribeye steaks on my Weber kettle grill the other day. It's interesting, you you watch these, you know, YouTube videos of these guys who are nerds about grilling, and sometimes they're like, don't put all that spice mix on it, just put salt, maybe pepper. Let that natural flavor of the meat come out. Right? Seasoned with salt. Our lives should have that kind of effect. <laughs> that it brings flavor and joy and happiness to other people's lives, that it has a preserving effect like salt did in the ancient culture. They would use salt to preserve things. Make sure that your speech is always gracious, he says. Sadly, Christians are not always known for that. Let's be known for it in person, on social media, in difficult situations, even in disagreement. Even if you're being persecuted for your faith, our speech should be seasoned with salt. We should be the most gracious people. Does your life do that? Do your words do that? Are you acting wisely, considering the way you interact with people who don't know Jesus and being intentional about that? Doing those things will open the door for you to speak the gospel. It's both. It's actions and words. It's living according to Jesus' pattern and then speaking. We love people in practical ways so that they will listen to us and then we step through those doors God opens. In turn, opening our mouths and speaking of Jesus. Gospel conversations are for every Christian, not just pastors, not just missionaries. You don't have to beat people over the head with it. And you may not get to share the gospel, the full gospel in every encounter, but prayerfully Open your mouth in faith that God will work. Last thing here, verse 5. 
He says, make the most of your time on this earth. Do you consider the use of your time in light of the mission of Jesus? I would argue that time is the most important resource you have. It is so easy to fritter away your time. I know this. <laughs> I know this in the evenings when I get home and we finally get sports practices done and bath time done and kids' homework done and lunch is packed for the next day. I just kind of want to sit on the couch and look at my phone and veg out. I'm not saying that's always wrong. <laughs> but man, how many hours have I wasted? It's easy to waste time. It's hard, but worth it to make the most of your time. And doing so in the mission of Jesus to save souls and make disciples is the greatest cause that you can pour your life out for, for His glory, and I promise you an eternity for your good. So I want to close our service. Well, we'll have a, a deacon prayer and a song after this too, but I want to close our sermon with, with a time of prayer. I'm going to go down here and pray on the altar. I want to invite others of you to join me come and pray at the altar. You can pray quietly at your seat. You can pray in groups. There's freedom, however you want to do this. But I want us to have a time of prayer asking God and putting this into practice. Devote yourselves to prayer. That God would open a door. Asking Him to help us step through the doors that He gives us this year. So can we, can we spend a few minutes in silent prayer? And I'll close on the microphone in a few minutes. Father, we come to you acknowledging that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. He is the vine, we are the branches. Our only life and vitality and hope and effectiveness in ministry comes through Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to see everything we do in light of the Great Commission, in light of the reason you still have us on this earth, to glorify you by making disciples. God, may we see our jobs, even the fun things that we do, in light of that, to watch for doors that you will open and to boldly and joyfully and graciously step through those doors with faith in our hearts. God, forgive me for the time I've wasted. Forgive us for the opportunities that we've allowed to pass by, the open doors that have been in front of us that we've ignored or been distracted from. God, open this, the eyes of our hearts to those. 
And may we never be ashamed of Jesus. May we always have faith that you'll give us the words, that you'll work through us. And may we step through those doors of loving people in practical ways, using the gifts and resources and time and energy and talents you've given us to, to love people, to meet their needs, but also speaking your truth, talking about the gospel, the blessed hope we have through your son, Jesus. God, we don't want to be a church that wastes your gifts. We don't want to be like that third servant in the parable of the talents that just buried the gift and waited till you returned. God, keep us by your grace from that. May we be found faithful taking the gifts you've given, taking the resources you've given, and using them for your kingdom to see lost people saved, to see disciples made, to see the world changed starting right here in Cordova. God, thank you. We praise you for the doors you've opened. We praise you for what you did in 2022, the opportunities you gave us, the people that were saved and the lives that were changed. May you do many, many more examples of that. God, bring revival to Trinity Baptist Church. Bring revival to our city. Spread it all across the world for your glory, Lord. We trust you. We acknowledge our absolute and total dependence upon you and ask that you would do the work in our hearts that you need to do. Find us faithful by your grace. Lord, from Philippians 1, 6, complete the work that you have started in us. May we be faithful in your mission this year. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Ted Bruno, would you go? Ted's going to do our deacon prayer, and then we're going to sing one final chorus. Dear Lord, we come to you with grateful and joyful heart, Lord, the joy of the baptisms that you have given us today. Lord, we are so thankful that you have planted us here in Cordova, in this community, in this world to do your work, Father. We pray that you will open so many doors for us like you have in, in 2022 that you will do in, in this new year for us. Lord, as Pastor Matt said, we pray that you would give, we, we would all give graciously of our time, our talents, and our resources so that we can better serve you, better serve this community, and better serve your world, Father. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, before we go into our brief business meeting, I want to ask if you would stand once again as we sing one last time together this morning our closing song, He is Lord. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead and He is Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. If you would be seated for a few more moments. to leave.